Welcome everyone. We're gonna give just a minute for folks to join and then we'll get started. Hi everyone, welcome. Um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. I know we still have some folks joining. Um, I wanted to go over first a few housekeeping items. So we will be recording this webinar. I just wanted to let you know that. And if you have questions as our speaker, Ellie uh, is presenting, if you'll write them in the questions panel, um, it's on the tab to the right, or at least it's on the right on my screen. I think it is on yours too. Um, and I'll relay them to Ellie. If we could go ahead and try that out, if you can find where the questions um, section is, and if you'll let us know where you are joining us from. If you happen to be from one of our Guidepost Montessori campuses, either as a staff member or as a parent, if you could let us know that too. Um, it looks like we have someone joining from Toronto. We've got Philadelphia, a Guidepost parent from Fairfax, a lot of Toronto folks, Portland, Oregon, Arizona, Charlotte, North Carolina, Birmingham. Have a lot of people joining. It looks like so far we already have 95 people on and I'm expecting more as we keep going. All right, great. Um, so I'm very excited to introduce Ellie Venegas, who will be sharing her wisdom with us today. Ellie is a Montessori mentor um, for Guidepost Montessori and Higher Ground Education, and she is also a Montessori parent. She has experience in our infant and toddler communities uh, within Guidepost Spanish Immersion Program, and she has a passion for partnering with teachers, or guides as we call them, as well as parents. Um, to help improve their craft and practices and to help serve the children that they work with. So welcome, Ellie. I'm going to turn things over to you, and I'll be back later when we have questions. Thank you, Kelly, and uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, just to jump into it, my hope for today is um, I'd like to dive into the driving forces in toddlers, and I would like to... Um, share answer a lot of the questions that the families that I've worked with in the past have uh, often had and I want to offer some tips and tricks that will help you um, in the work that you do with your children at home as well. So today we'll be chatting about sensitive periods, the areas of a Montessori environment, uh, what to do at home, and I'll also share some sample uh, activities with everyone. So uh, before getting into how to guide the toddlers, it helps to chat about what makes them tick. Um, through her uh, observations, Dr. Montessori was able to understand four stages of development and characteristics that, and the characteristics that define them. Uh, here's a quick overview, but today what we'll be focusing on is infancy. Um, this plane is characterized by the development of the absorbent mind as well as individual personality. And it's the beginning of the physical and biological independence in a human being. Um, in the toddler years, there are some what we call sensitive periods. And these sensitive periods are golden opportunities. From about 15 months to three years old, children have, it, 
are going through this prime time to acquire some very specific skills. It's an innate force that's driving them, this intrinsic need that they have to satisfy. Um, so here's a list and I'll give you a moment to read them over what the different sensitive periods that we acknowledge in toddlers. And I'd like for you to consider how they manifest in your child. Is there some of, are these some things that you're already starting to witness at home? I'm gonna guess that the answer for, for many of you is yes, if not all, some. Um, but versus going through the entire list, I'd really like to focus on five. So the first one I'd like to focus on is language. Uh, during the toddler years, the child's language explodes. On average, a two-year-old speaks about 200 words. In about a year's time, that number jumps to over 1,000. That's just fascinating. It was one of my joys in the classroom, seeing that language develop. And, um, you know, some children at 18 months were very verbal already, stringing two words together. And, you know, I had other children who were very quiet and, you know, some of their friends were talking before them. But when they decided to speak, it was just full sentences structured so beautifully. Um, so every child meets um, this need in different ways. Um, but there are things that we can do at home to support and meet the, the, the sensitive period to fulfill them in this time. Um, so I invite everyone, let's sports cast. Let's um, narrate a process as it's happening. Talking every step out of the way through to your child, even before their verbal is giving them language that they can collect in their minds. They're bu building this receptive bank of language. Um, so when they are ready to speak, they have the, the means to. And once your child does start being verbal, perhaps you'll hear some um, words like water gone, right? And you'll, this is when active listening and thoughtful questions come into play. So you say, oh, your water bottle is empty. The water is all gone. So you're repeating back what they said, but you're saying it in a very, um, in, a, in the correct way. We're modeling proper language, but also giving them a forum to speak and letting them know that they're heard. And so for everything that we repeat back, it's also helpful to ask them something thoughtful. So in that scenario where the water bottle is empty, we could follow up with, would you like more water? And they might say yes or not. And we say, yes, you'd like more water. Where is the water jug? And they might point, oh, it's in the kitchen. Are you ready to go fill your water bottle? And so this is the process that we like, uh, that we encourage. It's what we've done in the classrooms, and this is what uh, many parents have had success doing it um, at their own in their own homes as well. Another um, sensitive period I'd like to point out is order. Children at this age have such a strong sense of order. Um, can you recall a time where your child might have had an emotional uh, moment because their routine was disrupted or maybe something was out of place? I know as a mom, when my uh, son was about 18 months, this was something that I saw often. And I also recall a time um, in my classroom where I had moved a plant from one spot to another. And I didn't articulate this well with the children. And so every so often when I'd come into the room, I'd notice that one of the children had moved it, you know, back to its original place. And they have just, they're so, um, they're so fascinated by it, right? This is something that moves them. They need to know that everything belongs in its place. And so being that that's so, what we want to do is be thoughtful of the ways that we set up our, our homes, the way we set up our classrooms. And a few slides later, we'll jump into it a little bit more. Another uh, sensitive period is a refinement of senses. Uh, young children are developing their senses as they explore the world. And the more that their senses are developed, the more that they understand the world that they're in. Um, in Montessori, our, our goal isn't, it's not just to help a child do something for themselves or make them independent. It's to empower them 
to, to, to be independent, right? And let them know that the world belongs to them. And so if we give them opportunities to explore or to develop their senses, the more that we're empowering them to, to take advantage of the world, you know, and use it to, to form themselves. In this picture, um, this is uh, one of the, uh, a young girl that I had in one of my communities and she was working with the stereognostic bag, which is a mystery bag, a bag with uh, objects, sometimes random, sometimes of the same category, sometimes matching. Um, but the idea is we're putting our hand in the bag, we're not using our eyes, and we're using the sense of touch to feel. Ava was so committed to this um, activity that she closed her eyes very tightly to make sure that her hand was the, her, the only tool for this activity. Um, so this is one of the many um, experiences that we provide children in our classrooms, but I invite all, all parents and families at home to think of different ways of, to provide a range of experiences so your child is able to exercise all the different uh, senses. Um, next is the uh, concrete experiences. Toddlers need to live in real life. They're not quite at a place for the abstract, right? Um, maybe some children know how to count and wrote at this age, but they don't really understand that the symbol two is for one and two in quantity, right? So we're trying to help them ex experience life um, in a very real way. Um, and this, for this reason, busy work doesn't work. You know, if, we're, if it's a Band-Aid of, or sometimes just like our idea of keeping them engaged, but if it's just busy work without purpose, it's not gonna satisfy them. And while they might be excited at first, their focus is gonna dwindle. Um, but if we are empowering them to live their days independently, um, from waking up and brushing your teeth and washing your face to, you know, setting up your snack. All of these things that go throughout the day is what's going to occupy them because it's going to satisfy their need to, to live real life. Um, so what parts of your day can you involve your child in? What parts of the routine can they be in charge of? And lastly, small objects. Um, at 18 months, children develop a fascination for small objects and tiny details. Have you ever noticed maybe your child um, like fixated on a piece of lint on your shirt or maybe noticed a very tiny pebble that was tracked onto the carpet that you didn't? This is because they are at a sensitive period to work with small objects. In our classrooms, we have um, child size furniture and everything is at their level and we do implement small objects and this is to facilitate their freedom and independence in the work period to allow them to explore and, and develop themselves freely. Um, but another part of that is that we want to satisfy the child's need for small objects and experiences with them. So with that being said, another thing to keep in the back of your mind is what small objects can I incorporate in my child's day? How can I set them up um, for success in satisfying these needs? So now we talked about the sensitive periods and directly related, as I mentioned, small objects. What small objects do we have? Um, it's, it's, a lot of it has to do with preparing the environment, right? If we have the environment set up, then the child has more ability to decide for themselves or follow their, their inner drive without us directing it. So the three areas of a toddler uh, Montessori environment are psychosensory motor, language, and practical life. This is an example of what the psychosensory motor uh, shelves look like in our classroom. And I know psychosensory motor seems like a big, jargony word, but really what it is, is manipulative. So it's, there are activities where you have items that you fit into other items, right? Or lots of puzzles of different ranging challenges. Some are knobs, some are not, some overlap, right? Um, we also have some really intricate um, 
psychosensory motor work, which is how do we sew? How do we use scissors? How do we glue? All of these are part of our, um, our environment and they help the child um, work with concrete materials in a way that helps them get a sense of their world. This ties really well with the refinement of senses, that sensitive period. It helps them develop their eye-hand coordination in ways that allow them to take on more intricate tasks later on. Another part of our classrooms are, is the language area. In our classrooms, you'll see a lot of books based on real life. Um, as you know, toddlers, boys and girls alike love construction trucks. So we love sharing stories about real construction trucks, you know, um, books with real pictures of real things or stories of real people. Um, well, you know, there are, I, there are so many books that I do like that are not necessarily real images, right? Um, Swimmy, for one, is one that always comes to mind, uh, or Frederick. Um, so there's some really nice illustrated stories that uh, have some really beautiful concepts underneath them. But toddlers, again, they really love real life. This is what they're craving. So the more we can give that to them in the literature that we provide at both school and home, we're going to help satisfy that need. And on the topic of real, of what's real, we also want to um, share real objects. So sometimes in the classroom, we will group uh, categories of objects together and provide them in lessons. First, we introduce the name of items. And once we feel they've gotten a sense of that, we invite them to name the items as well. So this is something you can do at home. You can get a basket, collect some kitchen items that you can name. This is a spatula. This is a whisk, right? Or in your restroom, uh, this is a comb and this is a brush. And you can talk about the differences. Um, so while real objects are always priority and what we want, obviously we cannot have an elephant or a lion in our homes. So this is where pictures and replicas really come into play. Um, it's still a great way of introducing language and it's helping them expand uh, their understanding of the, the world beyond the walls at school and beyond the walls at home. And lastly, it may be my favorite, I say they're all my favorite, but practical life really has a place in my heart. Uh, but practical life is defined in three um, areas. It's care of self, care of the environment and food preparation. Um, and the reason I like practical life is just how consuming it is for a child, how satisfying it is. I, I always think of one boy, Bradley, and he'd come, he was coming in from the playground and his shoes were muddy. And, you know, I pointed out like, oh, I noticed your shoes are muddy. So he took it on himself to clean his shoes. He put down a placemat. He uh, poured out some soapy water, removed his shoes, sponged it, scrubbed it, dried it off, put it back on. Inevitably, when he put everything away, the table was muddy. So what did that call for? Bradley took a big red tray with a bucket and a pitcher and filled it with water. And he used a scrub brush to warm bubbles and clean it and dry it off. And what came of that? Dirty hands. So then he took a pitcher, filled it with water, filled a basin and washed his hands. All of this work, what it did, made for quite the appetite. So he prepared his own snack, cleared away the materials for preparing that snack. He set up his table and enjoyed his food. Before we knew it, the morning period was gone. And Bradley did this with, oh, I'd say almost no guidance, right? Other than maybe letting us know what, what it was that his plan was. But if we put in the work now to really engage the child purposefully in their days, they are driven to do so on their own. It takes a little work at first. So those are the areas of our classroom. This is what a, a, a typical guidepost environment looks like. Um, but what about your home? Obviously, we're not asking you to recreate an entire classroom in your, in your house. Um, but what we would like is to guide you in ways that you can provide these challenges and activities at home so that you can optimize your child's development during these sensitive periods. And also, I want to ease your stress. You know, um, 
when I first decided to to lead this webinar and I thought of toddlers, this was before all that we're experiencing now. And this pandemic has shifted things a lot for, I mean, that's that's an understatement. Like we're all having to adjust. And so I think that the, what we say next is very timely. And I hope that um, it helps you have some peace in knowing that there are ways of engaging your child um, peacefully and in a way that they enjoy and is stress-free for you. So before I jump into specifics, I wanted to give you just a quick overview, uh, a formula of what we can do to uh, help a child uh, achieve concentrated and independent work. It comes with preparing, right? We're gonna prepare our home in whatever way it calls for. We're going to prepare our plans for the day and we're gonna prepare very specific activities. So it's a threefold preparation, but it's the start. And we wanna model. And this is crucial. And, and so at first it takes work, right? Um, when I think of my time in the classroom, first I gave an introduction of a presentation where the child watched and I let them know, oh, I have something very special to show you today. Come, I'm going, to, and then I would show them every single step of the way. The second time I would break it down a bit. I'd give them a, a role in that presentation. I'd ask them to hold the cup while I poured. And so what came of that is once they figured out how to hold the cup, I'd teach them how to pour or vice versa, right? So the idea is at first it's a lot of work, but as we break down the steps for them and we revisit the same um, concept, it takes a couple of times, three, two, three times, and then they can practice on their own. And that's why we need to step away. We need to step away so that they have some time to practice on their own. When we do all three things, what results of it is that independence that we all want. So just to revisit, the overlapping development um, for toddlers is across these three areas. We have practical life, we have psychosensory motor or manipulatives, and language. So when we're planning our days for our children at home, we want to have a range of activities across these areas, um, but heavily um, based on practical life. And I'll talk more about why later. Um, and just as a, a flash forward to the second half of the infancy plane uh, for your children three to six or the children that we um, have in our children's house program, um, it's a little bit more of an expanded curriculum. Not a little bit, it's very expanded. If you ever step in, the range of materials that a, a child at that age has is amazing. They still have practical life. And instead of a psychosensory motor, similarly, they have sensorial which is really them working with concrete materials to build um, a foundation for more abstract concepts um, like math. And so language is, um, they're focused on them reading and uh, writing, right? Their literacy, but really what's beautiful about language is that it bridges the concrete to the abstract, which is math. Um, and so that's just a quick preview of what comes next. And so with all that being said, we want to have a range of experiences, but focus on practical life for success. Uh, daily life naturally creates real work for children, and it is establishes a process, establishing a process around routines will meet your toddler's need for concrete experiences and allow for concentrated and independent work. So teach them how to pour a glass of water, how to scoop cereal into a bowl, how to put dish, dirty dishes away. When they can do this for themselves, they are, again, engaged. And this is something less for you to worry about. Opening curtains, changing clothes, tidying up. Um, it, when children participate in day-to-day -day life um, uh, of the family, then they're, they're calmer, they're focused, and they're building their functional independence skills. So 
how to prepare. Uh, we want to make materials accessible for the children. So what does that look like for you at home? Do you already have a shelf, a bottom shelf cleared out for them with activities special just for them? Um, or maybe you could unhinge a door on one of your cupboards in the kitchen, and that could be your child's snack and dish hutch so that they can help themselves to a snack whenever they're hungry. Um, it also helps to have very designated spaces for, for items at, at home. Um, so if, they, if you have blocks, for example, the child knows specifically um, if they'd like to work with blocks, they know where to find them. And when they're done working with them, they can put them away. Um, also, we wanna choose purposeful work activities. As we mentioned, purpose drives the child. And also we want to make sure that they're n it's not, here's a coloring sheet, right? And when we have a very um, well-intended uh, art, open-ended art, that will um, engage your child for a longer period of time. Um, and we wanna make sure that we're limiting the options. We don't want um, to, to give them too many because that'll be overwhelming. But if we have two or three choices on one shelf for them to choose whenever they'd like, that's more inviting and um, that, that'll bring your family lots more, a, a lot more success. Um, and allow for movement. Toddlers need to move. So maybe you can start off your morning with a walk um, just out the yard or maybe a little a bit of jumping before they start their work period. Um, and you know, in between activities, between your work, your own personal work, maybe you can do some indoor gross motor activities to help them get their wiggles out so that they're able to refocus on work purposely. And also it's helpful to uh, define a clear workspace. You want to maybe uh, let them know this table is for art. This, the dining table is for preparing food. Uh, you can use this towel or work mat to work with your blocks. Um, or when we use, when we work with art, we use this work mat, for example. Um, so just think about which, in which ways you can do all of these to help prepare your environment for a successful um, homework period. So what's the process? Um, some of this I've already touched on, but we wanna plan. What are your activities for the day? What is the process for very specific routines that you will see every day? Um, we mentioned preparing, but have the materials ready ahead of time, right? It's not just having the setup going at home, but if you've planned the activities for the day, have those activities set up ahead of time. So you're not um, having to to break concentration on your own work to help meet your child's needs. But if you set it up in a way where your activities are set, the shelf is set, and you've introduced them to the options of the day, I um, mean, you've already taken time to show them how, then they have that freedom. And so talking about showing them how, um, it's important to model. And this is, I think, the part that I, I really wanna drive home is, it's not gonna happen overnight. You know, in our classrooms, um, this is something that we're working on day to day. We, we don't expect the child to, to have these skills down right away. But if we put in the work, it quickly, I mean, it's not overnight, but quickly enough, they're able to do it on their own. So we want to show them how do we set up the work in any activity that we do, in any, whether it's, you know, how we get dressed, right? How do we set our, how do we pick our clothes? And I gave the example of blocks. How do we put on a, down a mat or a towel to define the space? Anything that we do that we're engaging our child in, how do we do it? How do we set it up? And then once it's set up, we're working through each and every step. And we're telling them, you know, the key language behind it and always connecting it to the purpose, right? Oh, the floor is wet. Where's the mop? The mop helps us dry the floor, right? Always connecting it to what the purpose is will help them see the, all the steps through uh, logically. 
And once the work is done, we also want to show how do we put it away? Um, because this will um, lengthen their, their engagement, but also save you from the work later on of having to clean up all the, the remnants of different activities of the day. And so you've modeled it once, and the key is repeating and being consistent. Just because you showed it once doesn't mean that it's gonna click right away. But after the third time or so, they really start having a stronger sense of, of how it works. And even if they might not get all the steps right, they'll have a, a deep enough understanding to try on their own. Um, and this is what we call, um, this is why we work on uh, developing an understanding for the work cycle in the classroom. Um, we want the child to know that for every activity, we choose an activity, you can work for as long as you like and you put it away. And this, these are the building blocks for an extended period of um, concentration. And so this is something that you can replicate at home as well. And so I touched on this briefly as well, but why do we step away? We step away because this is when learning and practice happens. Giving the child opportunity to work on their own will allow for deep focus while developing independence and confidence. Um, you know, it, if we're there, sometimes it's a distraction. Um, it's almost a crutch as well. They know that we're there so they can ask us for help, right? Mommy, you do. And it's like, no, yeah, I think you can do it. But when we're out of the picture and have created some distance, this is a fascinating moment because they are in their own element, they are in their own bubble, and they're able to problem solve. If they are pouring some water and you've taught them how to pour water and you've taught them how to mop and they're pouring themselves some water and there's a spill on the floor, what are they gonna do? How are they gonna get the mop? <laughs> they're going to dry the, the spill themselves. Right, so it's, it's really um, giving them space to try out what you've taught them without you um, being a distraction to that. And so on that point, um, the overall point is that a daily schedule is critical and the, the heart of the day should be real substantive activities to engage your child because through engagement comes peace. And so I want to talk a bit about supporting your work at home. Um, our, fam our team is here to help your family with our new uh, family framework program. Um, so our team has created a new offering that is providing distance uh, learning experiences for your children. Um, and really what that means is, uh, I'm sorry, we have a, a distance learning with series of resources, virtual experiences for your children, routines and daily schedule support, access to Montessori experts, and regular webinars and workshops. So for the virtual experiences, what you get is um, your children are able to enjoy stories with a Montessori expert and other children as well. Um, they'll also be taught new songs and have an opportunity to, to continue on with the, the experience that they were having at, at school as well. Um, we'll also be giving lessons that align with what we would do in the classroom and also give you resources on how to support them. Um, our team of Montessori experts are also ready to answer your questions and troubleshoot the planning process whenever you'd like. Um, you know, even with the, the, the overview that we've had today, um, there's something about having a goal and a plan and something about living it and realizing that there's some challenges. So we're here to meet with you, to listen to your concerns and help you um, mitigate some of the challenges that you'll face. And um, to support that, we, our team has also created a bank of daily activity plans, along with activity planning bundles to include in your plan. So uh, this is a sample of um, a children's house age boy who um, had a day full of activities from uh, jumping math using marbles and uh, cut a color by number, he made a butterfly. Um, so versus you having to 
collect all this information for yourself. Our experts can help you create your own plan and provide you the, the tools that you need to help see them through. And also, um, like our webinar today, we'll continue to offer webinars and workshops. And these sessions uh, will guide you as you uh, set up your child for success and independence so that they can continue their work, their habit of work at home. Um, by the way, our next webinar is April 2nd, our, uh, supporting parents and children in uncertain times. So what's our goal? It's this. We want uh, your children to be able to work independently, even when you have many, um, because if we can help recreate in some way what they were experiencing in the classroom, then you're able to, to kind of see that development happen in your own home and also step away and know that they're well and, and still fulfilling those needs that we talked about in the earlier slides. And I did want to give you a quick overview of uh, some of the sample activities that we offer in our bundles. Um, so for example, we have watering plants. Um, and we give you a list of materials and steps that you can take to uh, model this for your child. So for example, you might say, oh, you notice that the soil in this plant is dry. You touch. And they they go ahead and touch themselves. Hmm. If the soil is dry, it means the water the plant needs water. Let me show you how I water the plants. And you take them over to the shelf and you point out that this is a watering can. This is a sponge. Might have it on a tray to make it easier to carry. Um, so you say, this is a sponge. This is a watering can. This is how I carry the tray. I'm going to make my way over to the sink. Uh, so you might have a step stool to help them reach as well. You show them how to fill the watering can. And you might say, um, this is how I hold the watering can. And I put the sponge against the spout so it does not spill out. You walk over and we show them how to pour into the plant. Um, so once we break down all these steps and we explain the purpose of each material, the child is able to try again the next time on their own, or they might decide to water all the plants outside uh, on the first try. Also, laundry is a fascinating time for them. Um, so matching and folding socks is a really simple but engaging way of involving your child in this day-to-day um, -day task. Um, and the way we go about it is we sort the socks, right? We mention um, this is a big sock. I think it's your dad's. This sock is so small. Do you think it's yours? And so we're, we can start um, creating some, so the foundation in sorting, which in sorting is a foundation for more intricate math later. Or we might even be able to point out the shape of the sock or the color. This one is white, this one's black, and you might have two piles. Um, and eventually they'll be able to sort on their own. And so they'll be able to um, do this without you. Um, and it could be something that you do once a week or a couple times a week. Uh, cleaning windows. This is similar to the way that we would go about um, pointing out that the soil is dry. I notice that the window is very dirty. Do you remember where we have our spray bottle and our washcloth to help clean the window? And so on. So we're, uh, you, some might use a squeegee, which we've used in the classroom and the children really love, but it's really that spraying that gets them. Um, they, they're fascinated to see the water go. Um, but this is another example, and these are the steps and the recommended materials that we offer in our bundles. Uh, sorting silverware is another great one, uh, or eventually they could clear the entire dishwasher if you'd like. Maybe you might remove the knife, but um, so you can start off with spoons and forks, two piles in that way. And then between once they've mastered that, you can break down small spoons, big spoons, small forks, big forks. And jumping is just 
an endless example of some of the activities we offer. Um, one of them, for example, is jumping obstacles, which is uh, really simple, something that you can do at indoors. You just fold some paper in half and set up mini tents across the, the floor so that you can invite them the added challenge of not just jumping, but trying to jump over an object. Um, and this is more for, um, it could, depending on the child's ability, um, I, I remember vividly 18 month olds um, trying jumping, but really they just do this little stomp with one foot, which just always got my heart. Um, but eventually, you know, if we start off simple and just say, can you jump once? Can you jump twice? Can you jump three times? And just inviting with numbers, eventually they can do something like jumping an obstacle course. Uh, and uh, nature walk is another example of um, an activity that has endless possibilities. You can create a masking tape a bracelet where you stick on blades of grass and petals of flowers that you find along the way. Uh, for older children, you can even do like a nature journal. Um, the, so we have many um, different examples of these that we can share with you. Um, so. That's um, the bulk of it. I'm curious to hear what questions our, um, our audience has. Thanks, Elliot. That was great. Um, we do have a number of questions. Um, I also wanted to mention before we jump into it, just because I want to make sure that we have enough time, that we'll be sending out more information about the suite of family framework uh, resources that Ellie referenced um, in a follow up email. and. In addition, if you have older children or if you know someone who does, um, I wanted to announce that we have elementary distance learning and we have limited spots available. So if you'd like to learn more about uh, that program and the associated fees, if you will visit guidepostfontessori.com forward slash EDL for elementary distance learning. Um, this is hot off the virtual presses. We actually launched today um, to our outside families, outside of our network. Um, so if you'll hold off actually on applying until this evening when we are, are fully set up, but if you wanted to go um, check out the information, you could do that. All right, so we have lots of questions. Um, let's see, Iona from Toronto asked, I want to ask, what is your take on doing Zoom video classes with toddlers? I think you might be muted. There you are. You know, it's it's interesting because we've always come from a place that no screen time is the best, right? But when I talked about, and I kind of reflected on this when I was creating my PowerPoint, but it's a real experience still, right? When it's meeting with another human being and you're making that connection, especially in these times where one of the, sorry, I kind of digress, but when we're going through the, the, care, the sensitive periods, one that I didn't go into deeply is socialization. While you, they might have you at home, those experiences are limited and they're hungry to connect with the outside world with other people. And so I think that this is a, a, a way that we're able to satisfy that need and, and it also helps keep us safe in these times. Um, and I just love like listening to Miss Laura lead her virtual circle times. I'm not sure if many of you have had the opportunity, but her voice is beautiful. And the children's faces and just the excitement, the smiles and the way they're dancing and singing along. I mean, those, those experiences are priceless. So I think that um, now we're at a place where we need to modernize the way we think, right? And technology is a tool. Are we, and are we using that to help satisfy the inter, the innate needs in our children? Or are we using it to just keep them busy? Because if it's empty and it's just flashy and not helping them develop, I would opt against it. But when it comes to these virtual meetings with Zoom, I think that we're lucky to be in a time where we ha we're stuck indoors, but we can still connect with the rest of the world. We're having that same con conversation in our uh, elementary distance learning program about using technology as a way to connect and still being able to deliver small group lessons, um, but not relying on all of the learning apps and online resources as much as, you know, there's still a lot of real work that you can do, um, but that would be the point of connection. So just interesting parallel there. 
Any recommendations for activities, both play and practical life to do with a 12 month old while home right now? This is from Mark. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so even in the, the bundles that we share, they're really grouped for like 15 to 18 month olds or older, but there's um, variations that you can do to simplify it. Um, so perhaps they wouldn't be able to sort those socks, right? but they're tall enough to kind of reach in and grab the first items of clothes. And so actually one of the, our elementary teachers posted a video recently of her daughter um, pulling out all the clothes from the dryer. And that was just such a neat thing to see because I swear she just started standing, you know? And I'm just like, wow. So the, just think of ways that you can simplify it. Hey, um, one of our, our terms is to isolate the difficulty. When I gave the example of like, um, we're teaching them to pour out of a dispenser, you know, they can hold the cup and you can help pour. So there's, you, they're not going to have the same level of independence, but what's really neat is that if you start now, in months time, what will they be able to do, right? So it's almost like you have a leg up and, and it's really just thinking about in this process, you know, how can I empower them and engage them to do one step? That's great. How would you respond to a nine month old frustration such as crying during a diaper change or throwing a plate during feeding? Ooh, that two, my mind went in like two different directions. Um, <laughs> well, for one, it, it's like two, for the first one is twofold as well. Sorry, I always go in different ways, but. We, it depends on your child, right? Everyone has a different personality. I've had children that um, they want you there when they're having a hard time, right? If it's just, uh, you know, a run of the mill emotional moment, they want you close by. And even just saying like, I see you're upset. You're upset because we had to put that toy away. It's time to eat, for example. Um, acknowledging that their emotion is valid and giving them the language for the emotion is helpful even at nine months before they are verbal. Because again, we're building that bank. I um, mean, it's also validating that we understand that they're feeling this way. It might mean that we're not gonna vacillate, right? We're still gonna see the, the task through, but we want to provide language. But when you provide language, it's tricky. Some children want it right away and some children I've learned like, oh, you are upset. I'm going to walk away and give you space. And when you're ready, I'm here to help, you know? And so then they kind of just work it out and I can help them. Um, but as far as diaper changes, it's engaging them in whatever way that you can. If it's at a changing point, the question would be if they're standing. Because if they're standing already or once they're standing, they might be ready for, um, or like pulling themselves up, maybe not standing individual um, independently. Uh, they, they could really benefit from stand-up diapering, and that's something that our experts could help you with if you want to learn more. But if they're at the changing table, sports casting, your diaper's wet. We're going to change your diaper. This is how I unstrap your diaper. One strap, two straps. And then you can ask them, can you help pull your legs up or ask them to hold the diaper in this process or pull the wipe for you? Um, and songs are a great distraction as well. If sports casting and, and, and engaging them in the process is not working, do a happy song. Um, something that you know that they like to kind of break them out of it. Um, and you know, these are some examples that are worth trying and they might not be the answer for your situation, but it's a place to start. Um, or, and the other one was throwing food when they don't want to eat, was that correct, Helen? Trying to plate is what, what the, I think it was Yasmin wrote. Yeah, so instead of um, like really drawing, like, oh no, why did you do that? Or we don't throw food, food, right? It's like, oh my, look at this mess. Like, it's time to clean up. Where is the dust pan, right? And so we're engaging them and we're not really feeding into the negative behavior. We're being very matter of fact about it. And once it's cleaned up, you can say, you know, food's for eating. 
if you are all done, you can let me know. And so nine months old might not be super verbal, but you can start with like baby sign, for example, where you can say, I see you're all done. So giving them language before they have language. Um, the only one other thing that I would suggest in, in both the changing, the eating in any situation is really observe. Try to track a pattern of when your child is hitting that point in each process and maybe try to catch it before. So let's say your child's eating quite a bit and you know that nap is like a couple of uh, some minutes away or whatever. You you want to maybe say ahead of time, like you've eaten quite a bit. Are you ready to put your plate away? And then we can do whatever the next uh, activity is. So it's almost anticipating the tantrum by collecting data so that you can um, catch it before it happens. All right, next question. How many activities should be available at a time? How often do you suggest cycling in and out of different activities? It really depends on your child's age and not just age, but their ability to focus. Um, so in, uh, I would say you have to kind of gauge how long each activity takes, right? Um, but you can anticipate that maybe three activities or so could fill about um, 45 minutes at a time. If it's a 10 minute um, window for each activity, I think that's a good stretch. So if, I wouldn't recommend having more than more than three options out at a time um, because then the options are too overwhelming. But it might also, I really think that engaging them again in day to day will take up more time than planning out like three specific physical activities, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. All right, I have another question from Leslie Ann. She wrote, uh, what about things that you do not want them to do, but are part of the cycle to complete the task? So she says, I don't, I do not want my son handling the mop. The handle is too long and I don't want him to injure himself or knock anything over in the process. So he will have to ask for help. Does that negate the independent skills that we are trying to develop? my question would be like what is the alternative to a mop so in this case i would just have a rag like a bucket and and a couple of cloths and say this is our bucket for for wet spills we can use these cloths to dry the the the, the spill like this if it's a big spill we might use more than one right and then you can even teach them how to wring the cloth an extension later is how to wash the cloth. So I definitely understand a big long mop can cause more work than, than good, but there's alternatives. So if you see that there's something challenging, um, one, that's one of the things that I often tell guides that I train is, if there is a challenging behavior happening or you know fear that you feel, what can we do about the environment? What can we do about the materials? What can we do about the process? to make it at the child's level and still eliminate our fears in it. Great. Um, another question, how do you handle language development in bilingual families? Ooh, that's a good one. So it, I, Kelly, are you able to ask for clarification? But I'm curious if it's like, if for example, one who speaks Spanish and one who speaks English in the same, like parents, Actually, it looks like she she did write in um, after that and said, what if uh, the daycare is taught in English, but at home we speak another language? Going forward, what language do we use? Keep to your language at home. Definitely. Yeah, um, there's something that it, it, it how, it's just so beautiful how quickly they absorb these languages. And what's wonderful is that that part of the brain that they're training to turn on and off different skills for different situations. So if at school it's always English, they're absorbing English at all times and in context day to day. And then at home they're absor absorbing whatever your native tongue is. And, and that's beautiful as well. So they have two different bubbles 
um, that they can use in different situations outside of school or home as it asks for it because they've been able to be immersed in both languages fully. And so for the families who are trilingual, and multilingual, I invite each parent to speak to their child in their own native tongue and to each other in English. So that way the, the, the conversation between the parents is still modeling English, but the child is getting the full um, the experience of both tongues at home as well, if that makes sense. It does. I'm glad you were asked that question and not me. <laughs> um, I have a question from Juan Ricardo. He says, what activities can we do at home now that would prepare a toddler that in theory is moving to children's house when we finish the quarantine? So one thing I experienced with um, older toddlers, especially those who had mastered a lot, a lot of the materials in the classroom, is that they really um, took on to the helper role. So a lot of what I talked about today is like teaching a child how for the first time and enforcing that at like 18 months or two or so. But if they're older, it's saying, okay, what do you know, right? Or maybe not asking it directly, but coming together with them to ask, you are capable of so much and we are grateful for that. We'd like your help with some of the things of the day, but we don't know what. Can you help us come up with a schedule of things that you'd like to do? And so when we're able to help them start making decisions for themselves and in their own learning, that's it's kind of like the, the difference of the two stages in infancy, that the children start becoming more conscientious of their development. Um, and as, as far as um, like language and math go, um, our, our children's house experts can kind of give you some ideas of what that looks like. Unfortunately, I'm not a children's house guide, so I can't really speak to that too much, but of what I was able to, what I had success with, um, in a toddler classroom with my older children was to invite them to decide for themselves in the way that they'd help the community. We sort of touched on this earlier, um, but there's a, a, a question that asks, how do you handle resistance to the process? Example, I don't want to clean up. So I think a lot of it has to do with the invitation, but um, there's a wonderful book, if you'd like to check it out, uh, Taking Charge, and gosh, I've recommended all the time, and the author is out of my mind now. But um, Taking Charge, it's a discipline book. You can Google it if you like. Um, and I don't agree with everything there, but it's really beautiful in the way that they talk about um, some of the common misbehaviors in children. And they really talk about how misbehaviors are needs, right? Um, they're not acting up to act up. They've, they're not so aware of themselves yet and what their needs are. And so there's like this outward projection of it without us, without them knowing the whys necessarily. And so it's it's our job as as parents, as teachers, you know, to to as adults, right? To kind of collect that information, try to discern what is underlying. But um, when they're trying to say, you know, I don't want to clean up, is that because they need more power in deciding what the process for cleaning up is? Right? Like, that could be it. I'm just like, that's one spitball idea. Um, but it's really talking to them like, when we work, we have to put it away. If you're not ready to put it, if you're not willing to put it away, let me know. And then we can decide something else. Or like, you know, kind of like, it, it's not like a reward and discipline kind of thing, but it's speaking to them logically so that they're able to decide um, their power in the process. I'm sorry. I don't know if I did explain that. Yeah. Well enough. That's great. Um, I had a question that came in actually before the webinar that asked, how do I make the most of outside play time and yard time, which I thought might be relevant for those that are um, in shelter in place situations, but can still go outside. No, a wonderful question. And again, 
They need purpose, even in gross motor, and they need gross motor. They need to move their bodies. So it's really coming up with a game, as simple as it may be, but have a goal at the end. So we, you know, this, I'm trying to think of some that I wrote last night, actually, but um, it, even if it's like basketball, right? We have these balls, there is the basket. Our goal is to work the ball into the basket. And then you do variations of it. Like, can you throw it backwards? Can you uh, jump and throw? And so it's, it's, the goal is this, ball into the basket. And the challenge is how we're gonna do it. Can you do it with your eyes closed? Are you doing it walking backwards? What is you know the process? So that's what I recommend for gross motor. It's still to present it in the same way that you would do any other activity, how we set it up, what the steps are, including a challenge, and how we put it away. That's great stuff. Um, I'm conscious of the fact that we are here at the end of the hour, and I do want to keep to our time, even though we have more questions. If we weren't able to get to your question today, um, if you could write the email that Ellie just flashed on the screen, which is community at twohigherground.com, uh, and I can get those questions to Ellie or direct them to the right uh, people or perhaps answer them myself if I know. Um, but thank you everyone for joining us and thank you so much, Ellie, for sharing your expertise. I think a lot of people find, found it very valuable. I got lots of positive comments that I look forward to sharing with you later. Oh, All right, awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Until next time.